A Patriot's History of the United States. Chapter 8, Part 8. The Demise of the Whigs. Whatever remained of the Southern Whigs withered away after the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Whigs had always been a party tied to the American system, but unwilling to take a stand on the major moral issue of the day. And that was its downfall. Yet, in failing to address slavery, how did the Whigs significantly differ from the Democrats? Major differences over the tariff, a national bank, and land sales did not separate the two parties as much as had been assumed in the past. Those issues, although important on one level, were completely irrelevant on the higher plane where the national debate now moved. As the Democrats grew stronger in the South, the Whigs, rather than growing stronger in the North, slipped quietly into history. Scott's 1852 campaign had shown some signs of Northern dominance by polling larger majorities in some Northern states than Taylor had in 1848. Yet, the Whigs disintegrated. Two new parties dismembered them. One, the American Party, arose out of negative reaction to an influx of Irish and German Catholic immigrants. The American Party tapped into the anti-immigrant perceptions that still burned within large segments of the country. Based largely in local lodges where secrecy was the byword, the party became known as the Know Nothings for the members' reply when asked about their organization, I Know Nothing. A strong anti-Masonic element also infused the Know-Nothings. Know-Nothings shocked the Democrats by scoring important successes in the 1854 election, sweeping virtually every office in Massachusetts with 63% of the vote. Know-Nothings also harvested numerous votes in New York and for a moment appeared to be the wave of the future. Fillmore himself decided in 1854 to infiltrate the Know-Nothings, deeming the Whigs hopeless. Like the Whigs, however, Know-Nothings were stillborn. They failed to see that slavery constituted a far greater threat to their constituents than did foreign conspiracies. The fatal weakness of the Know-Nothing Party was that it alienated the very immigrants who were staunchly opposed to slavery, and thus, rather than creating a new alliance, fragmented, already collapsing Whig coalitions. When their national convention met, the Know Nothing split along sectional lines, and that was that. Abraham Lincoln perceived that a fundamental difference in principle existed between anti-slavery and nativism, between the new Republican Party and the Know Nothings, asking, how can anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor of degrading classes of white people? He warned when the know-nothings get control, the declaration will read, all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. A second party, however, picked up the old Liberty Party and Free Soil banners, sought to unite people of all stripes who oppose slavery under a single standard. Originally called the Anti-Nebraska Party, the new Republican Party bore in like a laser on the issue of slavery in the territories. Horace Greeley said that the Kansas-Nebraska Act created more free soilers and abolitionists in two months than Garrison had in 20 years, and the new party's rapid growth far outstripped earlier variants like the Liberty Party. Foremost among the new leaders was Salmon P. Chase of Ohio a former Liberty Party man who won the gubernatorial race as a Republican in Ohio in 1855. Along with William H. Seward, Chase provided the intellectual foundation of the new party. Republicans recognized that every other issue in some way touched on slavery, and rather than ignore it or straddle it, as both the Democrats and Whigs had done, they would attack it head-on, elevating it to the top of their masthead. Although they adopted mainstays of the Whig Party, including support for internal improvements, tariffs, and a national bank, the Republicans recast these in light of the expansion of slavery into the territories. Railroads and internal improvements? 
that wig issue took on a new, unmistakable free soil tinge, for if railroads were built, what crops would they bring to market? Slave cotton or free wheat? Tariffs? If Southerners paid more for their goods, were they not already profiting from an inhuman system? And should not Northern industry, which supported free labor, enjoy an advantage? Perhaps the National Bank had no strong sectional overtones, but no matter. Slavery dominated almost every debate. Southerners had even raised the issue of reopening the slave trade. At their convention in 1856, the Republicans ignored William H. Seward, who had toiled for the free soil cause for years in favor of John C. Fremont, the Mexican War personality who had attempted to foment a revolt in California. Fremont had married Thomas Hart Benton's daughter, who helped hone his image as an explorer, adventurer, and allied him with free soil Democrats through Benton's progeny. Benton himself was a slave owner who never supported his son-in-law's candidacy, foreshadowing the types of universal family divisions that would occur after Fort Sumter. Beyond that, Fremont condemned the twin relics of barbarism, slavery and polygamy, a reference to the Mormon practice of multiple wives in Utah Territory. Slavery and the territories were again linked to immoral practices with no small amount of emphasis on illicit sex in the rhetoric. Fremont also had no ties to the know-nothings, making him, for all intents and purposes, pure. He also offered voters moral clarity. Southerners quickly recognized the dangers Fremont's candidacy posed. The election of Fremont, Robert Toombs wrote in July 1856, would be the end of the Union. The eventual Democratic candidate, James Buchanan of Pennsylvania, chimed in. Should Fremont be elected, the outlawry proclaimed by the Black Republican Convention at Philadelphia against the South will be ratified by the people of the North. In such an eventuality, the consequences will be immediate and inevitable. Buchanan, a five-term congressman and then senator, who also served as minister to Russia and Great Britain and was Polk's secretary of state, possessed impressive political credentials. His frequent absences abroad also somewhat insulated him from the domestic turmoil. Still, he had helped draft the Ostead Manifesto, and he hardly sought to distance himself from slavery. Like Douglas, Buchanan continued to see slavery as a sectional issue subject to political compromise, rather than, as the Republicans saw it, a moral issue over which compromise was impossible. Then there was Fillmore, whose own Whig party had rejected him. Instead, he had moved into the American party, the know-nothings, and hoped to win just enough electoral votes to throw the election into the House. In the ensuing three-way contest, Buchanan battled Fillmore for Southern votes and contended with Fremont for the Northern vote. When the smoke cleared, the Pennsylvania had won an ominous victory. He had beaten Fillmore badly in the South, enough to offset Fremont's shocking near sweep of the North, becoming the first president to win an election without carrying a preponderance of free states. Buchanan had just 45% of the popular vote to Fremont's 33%. Fremont took all but five of the free states. Republicans immediately did the math. In the next election, if the Republican candidate just held the states Fremont carried and added Pennsylvania and either Illinois or Indiana, he would win. By itself, the Republican Party totaled 500,000 votes less than the Democrats. But if the American Party's vote went Republican, the total would exceed the Democrats by 300,000. Buchanan, the last president born in the 18th century and the only man who never married to hold the presidency, came from a modest but not poor background. Brief service in the War of 1812 exposed him to the military. Then he made a fortune in the law. No easy feat in those days. His one love affair with the daughter of a wealthy Pennsylvania ironworks owner was sabotaged by local rumor mongers who spread class envy. 
The incident left his lover heartbroken, and she died a few days after ending the engagement, possibly by suicide. For several years, Buchanan orbited outside the Jackson circles, managing to work his way back into the president's graces during Jackson's Pennsylvania campaigns, eventually becoming the minister to Russia. As a senator, he allowed anti-slavery petitions to be read before his committee, running contrary to the democratic practice. His first run at the presidency in 1852 pitted him against Douglas, and the two split the party vote and handed the nomination to Pierce. After that, Buchanan had little use for the little giant, as Douglas was known, or so he thought. In 1856, Buchanan found that he needed Douglas, or at least needed him out of the way. So he persuaded the Illinois senator to support him that year, for which Buchanan would reciprocate in 1860 by supporting Douglas. After the inauguration, Buchanan surrounded himself with Southerners, including Howell Cobb, James Slidell, and his vice president, John Breckinridge, a strict constitutionalist in the sense that he thought slavery outside the authority of Congress or the president. He ran on the issue of retaining the Union, yet his Southern supporters had voted for him almost exclusively on the issue of slavery understanding that he would not act to interfere with slavery in any way. Buffeted by Uncle Tom's cabin and the rise of the Black Republican Party, the South saw Buchanan's election as a minor victory. Soon, the Supreme Court handed the South a major triumph, one that seemed to forever settle the issue of slavery in the territories. Yet once again, the South would find its victory pyrrhic. And we'll go on with Dred Scott's Judicial Earthquake in the next video. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. See you next time.